There we go. So I'm going to hand over to Peter Brown and later to Helen Roy from the UK Ladybird Survey. So over to you, Peter. It's going to be me first. So, um, over to you, Helen. <laughs> no, it's no problem at all. Thank you very much. And um, we're really delighted to be with you all this afternoon. It's fantastic to see so many people joining in. And, you know, huge thanks to FSC Biolinks for um including the Ladybird survey within um, this fantastic program. It's certainly some really exciting talks coming up. And I attended the Hornet one yesterday, which was really, really enjoyable and fascinating and amazing um, photos and videos. So thank you so much to FSC Biolinks. And um, I really hope that this is a program that continues um, going forward. But you know, the FSC have been um, so such fantastic collaborators for the Ladybird survey both through sort of publications and our very first atlas and um, we're always delighted to work alongside the FSC. So I'm going to begin this introduction and um, Pete will then um, take over about halfway through and maybe some of you attended um, the virtual meetup on the ladybird larvae um, a short while ago and I hope you've been enjoying the larvae. It seemed that it was well timed. There was a lot of larvae out and about over the last few weeks but we are now moving into the stage where we're starting to see the newly emerged um, adults and actually it's been tremendously exciting to see people's pictures of the adult ladybird just coming out of their pupil cases and people's absolute delight at seeing these sort of translucent yellow beetles as is the case for the seven spot ladybirds for instance. So I'm Helen Roy and I'm from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and Pete Brown is from Anglia Ruskin University and um, we together lead um, the UK Ladybird Survey um, as a volunteer recording um, scheme. So next slide please Pete. So during the course of the next um, 40, 45 minutes, we're going to um, take you through a short introduction to the ladybird family, what makes a ladybird a ladybird. And then we're going to um, describe some of the more common conspicuous ladybirds um, through two sections. We're gonna have a short question um, in between those two parts. So you get an opportunity to um, interact and then Pete will take you through survey techniques and making a record and we'll tell you a little bit about where you can go to find out some more and then we will be very excited to take your um, questions and try and answer them as as best as we can. So next slide please Pete. So the ladybird family, what makes a ladybird a ladybird? So they are a group of beetles and they're within the family the coccinellidae and um, like all beetles, they have wing cases and they also have biting mouth parts. So ladybirds are thought generally to be small to medium sized beetles. So in, in terms of some more um, specifics there, about one to 10 millimeters in length. So there are some really tiny ladybirds and there are some spectacularly big ladybirds. They're usually round or oval. Um, sometimes that oval can look a little more elongate um, than at other times. And often for the conspicuous ladybirds, they're called the conspicuous ladybirds because often the elytra are brightly colored and patterned, but also so is the structure um, behind the head called the pronotum where we have a, an arrow pointing um, to that pronotum, which is broader than it is long. And actually when I'm looking at a ladybird adult to start off with, I often go first to the pronotum as a first sort of set of features that I use to identify which species it is because that part tends to be a lot less variable than the wing cases. So some species are extremely color pattern variable and that can cause all kinds of um, confusion. So that pronotum is a really important part um, to take a look at. They have quite short legs and they're sometimes retracted under the body, which isn't very helpful sometimes for us because the legs are another great place to begin in terms of thinking about which species it is that you're looking at. So the leg color um, can give you a really good idea as to which species it is. And in terms of defining it as a coccinellid, if you were to take a look at the feet at the very end parts of the leg, you'd see that, um, well, you may not see because they're very tiny, but there's four segments, but the third so very small that 
you can just about see three segments, but that's quite technical. I mean, I don't, as much as I think the feet of ladybirds are absolutely beautiful, I don't spend a lot of time looking at the feet of ladybirds. I'm more interested to see the, the general coloration of the legs in terms of helping with the identification. But the antenna length is, is quite important in terms of making up a visual sign for us that what we're looking at is a ladybird because they have short and clubbed antennae. And there are some beetles that look very like them, but they have much longer antennae. So leaf beetles, the chrysomelody, have quite long antennae, but can look quite similar otherwise um, to ladybirds. So hopefully that gives you a little bit about the structure and the kind of um, sections of a ladybird that it's important to take a look at um, when you're beginning the process of working out which particular species it is that um, you are seeing. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So I think the seven spot ladybird, Coxnella septum punctata, is really an iconic ladybird and um, I think often if someone was asked to draw or describe a ladybird they would draw something that looked very much like the seven spot ladybird. It's a very common and widespread ladybird all across um, the UK and also through um, the Republic of Ireland and you'll see that on each slide we've got this little inserted map and um, we've chosen not to use the specific sort of dot maps of where all the records have been made over time but what we've done with all those amazing records that so many inspiring recorders have provided is we've kind of made this modeled distribution. So it fills in some of the gaps, but it gives you a better idea as to where you might be expecting to find um, some of the ladybirds that we're talking about here. So that's what those little maps look like. So you can see that this is a very common and very widespread um, ladybird and um, it's also quite convenient in it it doesn't vary in color very much at all or color pattern so it is this um, reddish color with these black spots and some people look at this ladybird and will um, report having seen what they think is a six spot ladybird but it's actually important to look at that spot directly behind the head that's sort of flanked with those two white markings and um, that's called the scutellary spot it doesn't really matter what it's called in a way but that is the seventh spot and the other thing if you look at that pronotum marking that black shape with those two white edges um, that's very characteristic as well of the seven spot ladybird and you can see it's a little short and clubbed antennae um, in that picture and that it has um, black legs. So seven spot ladybird very much always looks like a seven spot ladybird except for actually when it emerges first from its pupa as many people have been discovering across the country sending in their, their observations of these really bright yellow ladybirds emerging from the pupal cases and that's because it takes um, some hours um, for the spots to begin the colour pattern pigments to be laid down and the spots to appear and that red coloration to appear. And so actually at the moment, what we're seeing with seven spot ladybirds out and about is mostly they're quite a bright orangey color at the moment because that pattern is really going to develop um, over time. Great, so on to our next ladybird. So this is the 11 spot ladybird. So a very close relative um, of the seven spot ladybird. And this species did used to be much more common and widespread, but you can still find it pretty much across the whole of the UK, but it's not one that we see really, really often. For, so for example, I've never recorded it in my garden, for instance. It's often we're much more nowadays finding it in um, coastal locations. Um, it's quite a bit smaller than the um, seven spot ladybird. Um, it's slightly more elongate. You can see the pronotum looks very similar to the seven spot, but you can see very much it has this characteristic spot marking of, um, that you can see there again with a scutellary spot and then the other spots behind um, on those orangey red uh, wing cases. So that's the 11 spot ladybird. On to the next one, please, Pete. This is the Adonis ladybird. This is one that um, we're starting to see more and more actually, and many people are, are now recording it, many more people than, than previously did. So it seems to be a species that perhaps is thriving a little more at the moment than it has in, in the past across the UK. You can see from the distribution map, it has a more southern distribution than the other species that um, we've been looking at. Um, 
it's often found in slightly sort of warmer habitats so often on sort of gravel beds and things like that um, and again in coastal regions um, I always think that it looks as if the spots are sort of falling off the back of the elytra they're all at the back quite often I mean sometimes it will have little markings towards the front but very much the the spot patterning is sort of the second half of those wing cases but if you take a look at that pronotum marking, that's quite different um, as well. And it varies a lot, actually. Having said that, it often doesn't vary. You can see between these individuals, it is varying a little. But often, and you can just about make out, even on that very dark, um, the main picture, there's a little kind of white speckle in amongst the sh solid shape on that pronotum marking. And that's very characteristic on the pronotum of the Adonis ladybird. A really, really pretty and lovely ladybird to see. Next slide, please, Pete. So here's the two-spot ladybird. And this species is one that when I was a child in the 1970s and 80s, it was incredibly common and widespread. Um, and it is one that has undergone quite a substantial um, distribution decline and also seems to be declining in numbers as well. Although actually this year, definitely people are saying that they're seeing it a little more than in previous years. And this is our first one that we come to, which is really color pattern variable. So the typical form is that reddish form with the two, um, the two black spots. You can see it has black legs, so that's something to look out for um, as well. And it has a sort of M marking quite often on the pronotum, that black sort of M shape. Um, you have to excuse my descriptions if they don't quite match what, what your description might be, but you're, you'll find your own ways of describing these different markings. Um, and it has these white markings flanking either side. But when you look at that inset, the photo sort of inset towards the side, you'll see quite how color pattern variable ladies, ladybirds can be. So those, this is the same species, but yet there's this melanic color form with, and it can have up to six red spots. Something really important to, to look at here is the way in which um, that front red sort of splodge, more than spots, goes right down to the edge of the wing cases. So look out for that. If you see a ladybird that has these reddish spots, and white flanking markings on either side of the pronotum. Have a look and see if the red markings extend to the edge of the wing cases. And if so, and it's got black legs, then it's very, very likely um, to be um, this melanic um, two spot. I saw a chat come up around, do the males and females look different from one another? That's a really good point. And I think I should address that now that no, they, the color pattern wise, um, they look very similar. Sometimes the males are smaller than the females, um, but otherwise they look very, very similar. Next slide, please, Pete. So this is a close relative of the two-spot ladybird. So this is Adelia decimpunctata. The two-spot was Adelia bipunctata. It's another very color pattern variable species. I, I think this ladybird is just amazing how you can see all three of these different color forms in quite close proximity to one another. And I've been seeing quite a few coming through on iRecord, our recording platform of the one at the bottom left-hand corner, which is called Bimaculata. And it kind of has those very neat kind of stripes going across the shoulder, or those splodges at the shoulder. What's really important to look at here is that they have brown legs. So you remember I told you the two-spot ladybird has the black legs. Well, the 10-spot ladybird has brown legs. The typical color form is in the middle and you can see the spot markings there. And I'm gonna show you those again in a moment when I put it up alongside a harlequin ladybird. It's a very widespread um, species um, and comes in all of these color forms. So the top picture is the checkered color form, we call it. Now, because it comes in so many different color forms, it's incredibly confusing to um, have a look at which one is which. And also, there seems to be a possibility that some of them are mimicking other ladybirds that are more toxic than themselves. So of course, if they're mimicking, that's gonna to add to our confusion as well, because they're gonna look like some of the other ladybirds. So we're gonna talk you through some of the sort of confusion species. But I guess the really important thing here to say is, just have a go at the identification. And 
if you get it wrong, you're in very good company because Pete and I are often checking with one another. Just, you know, we might get a ladybird that looks just slightly, we're just not sure. And for me, it's often the 10 spot ladybird that caused me all kinds of confusion because, um, if you see it in the field, it's easier because it is quite a small ladybird and that sets it apart from some others. Um, but it can look very like some of the other ladybirds. So there's never any harm in making a mistake. And I actually learn a lot more from the mistakes I make um, when Pete or others correct me um, than from when I get it right, I guess. OK, so the next slide, please, Pete. So here we are. So the Harlequin ladybird. And I think you'll see the one in the very top um, corner can look very, very like a 10 spot ladybird. But what I would say here is, I often refer to them as the shoulder spots, and now I'm gonna to point to them, which really no one um, can see, but the, sh the, the shoulder spots are those ones I sort of think behind the pronotum. And the harlequin ladybird usually has two there, whereas the 10 spot has one. Um, that's not always the case, so it's not totally, totally um, clear, but it generally the harlequin ladybird is more spotty than the, um, 10 spot when it comes in this particular color, color form. They do have brown legs, they have that M-shaped marking. So again, the pronotum is probably the more reliable place to look. So you'll see on the Harlequin ladybird, there's that m shape marking on the um, this orangey spotty color form. Whereas on the 10 spot, it was more speckled. And I, I think I've got a photo coming up where I'll show you them together. But just to mention again, another very color pattern variable species, and you can see this mating pair here with the color form we call succinia, which is the orange with lots of spots, and um, the male here has a form that we call spectabilis, so it has a black background with the four red spots, a really striking, striking difference. But you can see they've both got brown legs and they've both got a very similar um, pronotum. So this is a species that we could talk a lot about, but it didn't arrive in the UK until 2004, but it is very, very widespread now um, across um, the UK, not so much up into Scotland and some parts of Wales, but pretty much it's quite a, a dominant and abundant ladybird, um, the Harlequin ladybird, Harmonia axaridis. So next slide, please. So here we are, here we have the two um, up side by side, and as I say, these are the two that cause most confusion, I would say. But the 10 spot is quite small. And um, the Harlequin ladybird, which um, was originally native to Asia and was introduced into a number of countries all the way around the world, not the UK, but many other countries as a biological control agent of pest insects. And um, all the ladybirds I've spoken so far about are predatory ladybirds. Harlequin ladybird is a very voracious predator. Unfortunately, it's also quite a generalist predator um, and um, seems to be a top predator in amongst all the other ladybirds and other things that eat aphids. And it arrived in the UK in 2004. So yeah, the, sp the shoulder spots are something to have a look at. Um, two on the Harlequin and one on the um, 10 spot. But the Harlequin has four rows of spots and the 10 spot often um, this has these three rows of spots. I think that really looking at that pronotum is important, but size is important um, as well. But always just get them checked out. We're always very happy to look at um, pictures and try and unravel it with you um, together. Next slide, please, Pete. So this is the beautiful Tithaspis um, 16 spot ladybird. And I've been really enjoying um, through the lockdown period, the number of people who've been sharing their pictures of 16 spot ladybirds, particularly in dandelions. And um, the 16 spot ladybird is a really quite a tiny ladybird, but you can see along the edge of the wing case there, it has the sort of fusion of those three spots at the base, which kind of makes it look like a little wiggly line along the bottom. It's also got this really dark marking between the two wing cases. And those are the features which really make it stand out from some other species. But here it is feeding on the pollen. This is not a predatory um, ladybird. It will be feeding on the pollen. It's feeding on mildews and all kinds of things like that. Um, but a really stunning one to see. And it's just striking how often when you see it, you see it in very large numbers. But I can go for many, many weeks without seeing a 16 spot ladybird. And then suddenly you see an awful lot of them in one place. So that's the 16 spot um, ladybird. 
Here we have the stunning 22 spot um, ladybird, um, Cillabora. And um, this is another mildew feeding um, ladybird. So yes, this one does eat um, fungi and it's grazing it off the leaf surface. Really bright yellow and a very, very spotty, spotty ladybird. Um, this is one of Pete's favorite ladybirds um, and it is a really stunning ladybird. Quite a widespread distribution, but not so much into um, Scotland. The next one, please, Pete. This is um, the 14 spot ladybirds. This is back to the predatory ladybirds. This is an aphid feeding ladybird. Often if you're in an agricultural setting, it's probably sort of the third most common ladybird you might be encountering in that kind of setting. So it's quite common. Um, it has these square spots. So that's very, very characteristic. But those spots sometimes can, can get fused with one another and make it look very like a checkered um, 10 spot ladybird. But take a look at that pronotum marking, because this is the real way to separate out the 14 spot from um, the 10 spot ladybirds. It has, I think it either looks like a sort of clenched fist that's filled in or maybe a crown. Anyway, it's a solid shape, a solid and wiggly shape, um, rather than that more speckled M shape of the 10 spot um, ladybird. Um, so yeah, that's um, the 14 spot ladybird. Some people think it looks like it's a smiley clown face. If you were standing on your head now, you might think that on that one. Um, other people think it looks like it's got an anchor shape down the middle, um, but those square spots are very characteristic. Next one, please. So yeah, so I think it can look very, very like um, the 10 spot ladybird in the checkered form, but hopefully you can see those very different um, pronotum um, markings, um, but I think you'll agree the the wing case markings can look very very similar. Next one, please, Pete. So we thought we'd have a quick question um, and answer before handing I hand over um, to Pete. So we would like to ask you which species is this. So take a look at the pronotum marking and then answer the question here. I don't know if we can move the box so you can see behind it in case you didn't get um, a really good look. Um, but it seems like lots of you are coming in um, with yeah, your they, they should be able to move it individually on their oh, okay. screen, Helen. So. Great. I shall try that out myself. You can indeed. I'm just moving it on my own screen. And you can move it so you can take a good look at those wing case markings. It's retracted its legs underneath, but that's fairly characteristic. So you can't see its legs um, at the moment, but I will tell you its legs are brown. Uh, I'll just add as well, Helen, that I've figured out how to make it anonymous. So even, even myself and Helen cannot see who's putting what. So feel no, free, yeah, yeah. everybody have a guess, even if you're not sure. Yeah, most definitely. And do you remember, this is the one that is my most confusing ladybird species of all. This is the one I've been out on field work with Pete before and um, got in a muddle over this one and Pete's had to say to me, oh no Helen, it's not that one. And then for a long time I go without making a mistake again and it's a confusing one. So shall we, we've got a lot of responses in already. We've got about 80% of people voted. We'll give just a few more, we'll give eight more seconds to put in your final um, responses and um, then I can reveal that most of you were right. It is indeed a 10 spot um, ladybird. And um, remember that it is these, it only has one shoulder spot, so to speak, whereas the harlequin might have the two, two spots on either side. And um, the 14 spot has these very, very square um, spots that fuse together to look like either an anchor or a sort of smiley clown face. So that's um, fantastic. I shall now hand over, put myself on mute and I shall hand over um, to Pete. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Helen. Um, right, so I'm going to carry on and introduce you to a few uh, extra species and then we'll say a little bit, um, tiny bit about larvae and a little bit about survey techniques and, and that kind of thing before we end with the question and answer session. 
So the first one that I'll talk to you about is the pine ladybird. And this is a species that's actually found on lots of different types of trees, not just pine trees, but a range of deciduous trees as well. Uh, you may find this one. And Helen earlier on showed you the two spot ladybird, which has a black form, which can look quite similar to this in some respects. But she was saying that the markings at the front, this red spot, go down right to the edge on the black two spot ladybird. Whereas you can you can see on this one, it doesn't go to the edge at all. And you've got this kind of rim around the wing cases of the pine ladybird. And that's a characteristic feature of this one and another two species that are closely related to it. So the pine ladybird pretty much always looks like this. There's very little variation and you can see a nice little cluster of pine ladybirds on the, the bark of this tree in the top picture. Um, it has four spots, two little ones at the back and two at the front which are comma shaped. And it's got a very wide distribution and it's a fairly small species, but it doesn't ever have any white markings on it at all. So it's entirely black, just with the two red uh, marks. A close relative of that is the kidney spot ladybird. And that looks very similar, but this one just has two red spots, two big red spots. And obviously we're seeing this side on, so you can just see one of the spots here. But similar to the pine ladybird, the kidney spot has got this rim around the wing cases, which is really quite distinctive. This is one that will often be found on the um, bark of trees rather than on the foliage, although not, not in this picture. Um, it feeds on uh, scale insects and it may often be doing that on the, on the bark of, of the tree. Things like ash trees are a good place to find this kidney spot ladybird. There's a third species in this group that we'll just briefly show you. And this is the one in the middle, the heather ladybird, which is quite a small um, ladybird. Again, completely black, just with little red markings. But in this case, it's got a kind of little dotty flash of red markings across the middle. That's very much a habitat specialist and you'd find it in heather heathland. Whereas the kidney spot ladybird and the pine ladybird are species that you're much more likely to find in gardens. But these three, again, all have the sort of rim around the edges of the wing cases that make them distinctive. So they're, they're in a slightly different group called the Chyla Carini, um, slightly different group compared to the other ladybirds. And just looking to compare these against black harlequin ladybirds, um, really just two things to say three things actually. So firstly, the harlequin ladybirds would normally be quite a lot bigger. The other three are a much smaller species. Secondly, black harlequin ladybirds usually have some white markings on them, these sort of false eye markings on the pronotum that you can see on both these black harlequin ladybirds. And also um, they've got brown legs rather than black legs and they lack this rim around the wing cases. Moving to a very different um, type of ladybird, and this is a, a mildew feeding species. Absolutely beautiful, stunning ladybird to see. This is the orange ladybird, very widely distributed. So this is one that can quite commonly be found in parts of Scotland, in deciduous woodland and perhaps gardens. And um, it's really very distinctive. It's the only one generally that's very orange with white spots. It's a kind of medium sized uh, ladybird. Now saying that you can't confuse it with anything is not strictly true because sometimes orange ladybirds can look a bit like this one. I'll come back to, to, to that again in a moment. But this is the cream spot ladybird. And you'd find this one in similar kinds of habitats to the orange ladybird. So generally on deciduous trees. This is a predatory species though and it's generally darker in colour, uh, much browner, and has these um, creamy or, or white spots. There's a second brown ladybird with white spots that looks, again, a bit similar to the cream spot ladybird, and this is the 18 spot ladybird. 
This one though is quite a lot rarer, generally speaking, and is much more of a habitat specialist. So this is a species that you would generally find on conifers and particularly pine trees. Um, and a difference between this uh, 18 spot ladybird and the cream spot is in the kind of um, way that the spots are arranged on the ladybird, uh, not such a neat row on this one, and these uh, slightly strange um, shaped spots near the front, kind of like two little L shapes. So if we look at the three of them together, here's our orange ladybird and the cream spot. So a pale cream spot ladybird and a dark orange ladybird can look fairly similar. 18 spot and cream spot similar, but nice neat row of six spots in a line here on the cream spot and a bit more um, not such in a straight row on that 18 spot. All roughly similar size though, these ones. So the 18 spot I mentioned was a, a woodland, um, sorry, a coniferous woodland specialist, and so is the eyed ladybird. And this is our most spectacular ladybird, perhaps. It's our largest species, and it's really a very beautiful one to see. It sometimes crops up in, in gardens, um, occasionally on deciduous trees as well. But generally speaking, it likes things like Scots pine trees. And the spots on most eyed ladybirds have these pale rings around the black spots. That's not always the case, and there are versions of this uh, eyed ladybird that don't have those pale rings. But the pronotum markings that Helen was speaking about as a key way of identifying different ladybirds are quite distinctive on the eyed ladybird with this very prominent sort of M-shaped marking and these dark patches on the side of the pronotum. Staying in similar habitat, the cream street ladybird, this is another one that tends to be found on coniferous trees. Um, and it comes in two forms. Um, it's got a form, the most common form is the one shown on the right, and this has 16 spots. The form that gives it its scientific name, so you can see it's called Harmonia quadripunctata, indicating four spots. So the picture on the left kind of shows you the form that gives it that name, and it's just got two little spots on the edges of each of the wing cases, so four spots altogether. Um, that form tends to be a little bit less common. Now this is a close relative of the Harlequin ladybird. The Harlequin is Harmonia axiridis, so this one is the same uh, genus. It's a little bit smaller than Harlequin ladybird. As I say, it's normally in um, coniferous woodland. And also the coloration is a bit different. This is a bit more, um, this kind of shade of red is a, is a bit different to a more orangey Harlequin, although there's variability there. And as its common name suggests, it tends to have these kind of streaky, cream streaky markings on the wing cases. It's also much, uh, much more of a sort of flatter species than the Harlequin ladybird, which is very rounded and domed. So that's the cream streaked ladybird. Yet another one from uh, pine woodland, um, the striped ladybird. This is a relatively uh, scarce ladybird um, and it's a habitat specialist. It's another really big species. It's one of the largest ladybirds, so perhaps just a little bit smaller than, than the eyed ladybird. Lovely brown colour with these kind of uh, stripy or streaky pale markings. It's really quite distinctive and probably based on its size and the colour pattern and also the habitat, it would be uh, a relatively easy one to identify. The 24 spot ladybird is a much smaller species. It's a species you're much, much more likely to find perhaps in gardens or by the edges of arable fields. This is a grassland specialist. And it's the only ladybird we're mentioning today, which is a herbivore. So this one feeds on um, false oak grass and various other uh, plants and it's a, a little bit of a hairy ladybird so you can perhaps see from these pictures it looks kind of fairly matte in appearance it's because of all these fine hairs on the wing cases 
all of the other ladybirds we've looked at so far have had very smooth, shiny wing cases. So this one, and there's one other that's broadly related to this, uh, that has a much more restricted uh, distribution. That one's called the briny ladybird. Those are the two that are uh, much sort of hairier than, than the rest of the ladybirds that we have. And they're both herbivores. Um, so this one, very red all over, even the pronotum is very red, just with these uh, lots of little black spots. The, the spot patterning can be quite variable. So you can see on the picture in the top right of your screen, sometimes the spots kind of all fuse together and um, look a bit messier. So that's a 24 spot. So we'll have a, a short um, poll again, um, similar to last time. So Kieran will launch that for us. So this, the question is, which species is this one? So again, it, it is anonymous. So don't worry if you're not too sure. Um, you can still have a guess without anybody knowing except yourself whether you got it right or wrong. <laughs> but the answers seem to be flying in for this one. Maybe that we maybe we made that one a bit too easy. So we'll just give you a few moments longer. I think most people that are going to answer have probably answered. So it is indeed an eyed ladybird. Um, it's not, so it does look quite similar to a harlequin in some respects. Um, the differences would be harlequin ladybirds wouldn't have the pale rings around the spots. Um, the markings on the pronotum perhaps a little bit different, although, you know, that's, they do kind of both have a sort of M-shaped marking, but this edge bit of the pronotum would be a bit different on the harlequin. Another thing to look at in this one will be the leg colour. So eyed ladybirds have black legs. Appreciate this isn't very obvious from this picture. Harlequin ladybirds would have red or brown legs. So, uh, well done on the poll. Don't worry if you got it wrong, but most people got that one. So let's move on and talk about a few more things. So those are all of the conspicuous ladybirds that we wanted to introduce to you today. Now, there are a few other species that we find in the UK that um, we've not spoken about, either because they're much more restricted in their distribution or they're very much habitat specialists. So there's a few extras to be aware of that we haven't talked about. On top of that, and don't worry, we're not going to go through all these, but we've got another 20 or so what we would call inconspicuous ladybirds. So these are generally very small, rather sort of cryptic and well camouflaged, uh, usually hairy. And to be honest, most people don't often notice them at all. But they are species that we're trying to encourage the recording of much more. So if you have a careful look, you may find one or two of these species even in gardens. Um, one of them is called um, Rhizobius latura is its, uh, is its scientific name. Um, and that can be a fairly common ladybird actually. It's just a little brown one. Um, trying to spot without my glasses on which one it is on. It's this, this one here on the uh, screen, the sort of fourth one in the corner. Anyway, it doesn't matter. There's lots of these little inconspicuous uh, ladybirds that you just perhaps should be vaguely aware of and if you see anything small but very ladybird looking like then maybe it's one of these inconspicuous species. Now the, we've had a separate webinar about ladybird larvae which has been recorded so if you want to go back to the FSC's um, YouTube page then you'll be able to watch that in full. I just thought I'd very briefly show you what ladybird larvae look like for those of you that didn't uh, see that other session. And these three pictures here are just typical examples of ladybird larvae. So they've obviously look completely different to the adult ladybirds. 
rather grub-like or, or caterpillar-like in some ways. So this is the juvenile stage. They shed their skin several times before um, turning into a, a, the pupal stage and out from that pupa comes the adult. So seven spot ladybird, sorry, one at the bottom, seven spot ladybird larvae have been very common uh, this year and recently, especially around June time. Uh, the harlequin is a much spikier um, sp uh, larva with an orange L shape down the side. And at the top, we can see a two spot ladybird larva as well. That's all I'm going to say about larvae for now. If you want to go out and look for ladybirds, we thought we'd say a little bit just for a moment about how you might best search for them and also the kinds of places you might go to find them. So our old friend Bob Frost on the left hand side is using his upturned umbrella to do a version of tree beating or ivy beating in this case and that's one way you can look for ladybirds. You don't necessarily need a uh, a beating tray you could use an umbrella in this way preferably a pale color and then you just tap the vegetation perhaps a tree branch or the ivy with your stick or whatever and the insects will fall into your uh, umbrella so that's a nice way of finding things that might be a bit hidden amongst the vegetation and then there's sweep netting if you happen to have access to a sweep net so this is a sturdier net than a butterfly net it's a canvas uh, thing that i'm holding in this picture and you sweep it through the vegetation to uh, get insects in your net and then you can identify them. So that can be useful for some of the, particularly finding the inconspicuous ladybirds that might be less visible and perhaps hidden down low to the ground and very tiny. But you can just look for ladybirds by eye, looking on foliage or um, you know perhaps the, the leaves of trees or nettles or other, uh, other types of vegetation. Um, some people are better at this than others. I tend to prefer to, you know, do a bit of sweeping or beating. Helen's very good at spotting these things by eye and children tend to be very good at spotting them by eye. The only other piece of equipment that really might be useful to you is a hand lens. Um, certainly as your eyesight deteriorates, as mine has started to do, I'm finding I need to use the hand lens more and more. And for certainly for some of the smaller species, a hand lens is very useful. You don't need to usually look at them under a microscope. Um, final thing on this, in terms of habitats to look at, you may well find you've got a number of species in your garden. Um, I've found, I think, about nine or ten different species in my garden. It's not a spectacularly large garden or anything like that. Um, so there may be a lot there, but if you want to broaden out from that, if you look in deciduous woodland or coniferous woodland, sometimes wetland areas can give a slightly different range of species. Um, and sometimes heathlands can be very rich in species. So it's just about maximizing the different habitats that you, uh, that you look in really. If you want to send us any records, we'd be absolutely delighted with that. And no doubt there's lots of people on the on this session who do already send us records. So thank you very much uh, if you do. Um, the records get submitted through a system called iRecord, which you can access either directly, there's an iRecord website, or you can go to the UK Ladybird Survey website and it feeds you in to submit records there. What we're increasingly finding people are using are the smartphone apps. There are two or three different apps that you can use to submit Ladybird records. There's an iRecord app for which you can use for any kind of UK species. Um, and there's a specific European Ladybird app now where people from a number of different European countries can submit records and they go into to iRecord for people in the different countries to verify. So we're finding that works very well for, for lots of people if you happen to have a smartphone. If not, fine, uh, and you have access to the website, submitting the records through there is great. Um, there are some useful resources that will help you in your identification and two of them are Field Studies Council uh, resources. So these are fold out charts. You can see the small pictures here of the charts for adult ladybirds and larvae. Um, they're about three or four pounds each, something like that. Um, 
and we'll put a plug in for the field guide to ladybirds which is a relatively new book uh, and it's got beautiful illustrations by Richard Lewington um, of all of the uh, adults and larvae and pupae of the uh, conspicuous ladybirds and adults of even all of the inconspicuous ones. The little maps that we've been showing on the um, slides here have, have come from that book as well. So that's all we would like to say for now. We've probably said too much and gone on too long, I'm not sure. But um, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, and we're very happy to try and answer any of your questions. Oh, before we do that, I must acknowledge all of the, um, the images on the presentation here. They're, they're almost all from other people recorders and other people that we know that have let us use their images. So thank you to them for uh, for the lovely photos. Yeah, just to also mention there's a Facebook page that uh, Richard Comont, who's provided a number of the photos um, that he is involved with. And um, we also have a UK Ladybird um, Twitter um, account. So yeah, just um, we look forward to hearing from you, but yeah, I just wanted to add to Pete's thanks to everyone who sent in their, their records. Um, you all really make um, our work of um, coordinating the UK Ladybird Survey hugely enjoyable. So thank you all very, very much. So am I right in thinking, Helen, your job would be even more enjoyable if more people sent in records? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and um, as you know, as we're saying, I think that Ladybirds are quite an accessible group, but there are the odd ones that are a little bit confusing as we've been through um, today. So, you know, we're happy to help with identification. That's part of what we really enjoy doing as well. So don't worry if you have a bit of uncertainty about what it is you're seeing. We can we can work it out together. OK, so are you guys ready for some questions then? Yeah, well, there's been some coming on the chat and Pete and I, I noticed we've been answering a few of them, but we're, I love getting questions. And I know Pete does as well. So, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. So what I might do is I might read some of them out. If anybody's got a question that they'd like to ask in person, if you put your hand up, um, what I might do is read some of the ones out that you've already answered and just clarify a few things in case yeah. people haven't seen that in the chat. Because I, I saw one recently while we're talking about recording, somebody asked about the C cap and asked if that's the same mm. as the I record app. And I noticed that you've said, Helen, that that's I naturalist. Yeah. And am I right in assuming that the Ladybird survey, UK Ladybird survey, doesn't get the I naturalist record? No, we can do. And um, so maybe just for a quick sort of clarification around the different sort of recording platforms. So we use iRecord, which has all of the UK species lists for many, many, many different taxa. So it's used by many of the recording schemes and societies that you can get involved with. And um, it's really bespoke to UK recording. Um, iNaturalist, and it is confusing because they always have that I at the beginning, is um, place where you can submit records wherever you are in the world or you can upload them and then unlike with iRecord so with iRecord Pete and I for the ladybirds are behind the scenes um, verifying um, the records that are coming through checking out your records helping with ID if there's any difficulties and um, putting them then through to the NBN Atlas and onto global platforms. So iNaturalist has a different way of working. The community get involved with identifying and confirming whether or not what you've seen is what you think you've seen. So they, different platforms have different values. The important thing is we try and link them all up behind the scenes. But iRecord is a very good one for within the UK recording. Brilliant, thank you, Helen. Um, so I'm going to come to, to you again, Helen, because I've got an ecology question here. Quite a few people asked about the role of ladybirds as pollinators. Mm. So they asked if, if they're counted as pollinators, if they act as pollinators. So would you be able to, to clarify the role of ladybirds in pollination in the UK? Yeah, so it's a really excellent question. So definitely, particularly at the beginning of spring, many, many ladybird adults, when they first emerge from their, their winter time, so that all of these ladybirds overwinter as adults um, in the UK, um, so they're completely dormant. And then when they start to kind of wake up for the springtime, 
many of them, the first thing on their mind is to kind of get some food and to get some resources. And at that time, if they're predatory, there may not be so many aphids and things around. So a lot of them then go in, into flowers and feed on pollen um, for an early source of food. And of course, in doing so, they pick up pollen and they carry it around. So in that way, they're kind of accidental pollinators. But often when we're looking at whether an insect is an important pollinator or not, there's often sort of features of the ladybird, of the insect that so bees being really furry that the pollen sticks to them very very well whereas often with ladybirds because they're a bit shiny the pollen falls off although pollen can be quite sticky and stick to them but it's not unusual for us to see ladybirds covered in pollen around their mouth parts and over their heads and then for sure they're they're pollinators at, um, but yeah, in a slightly more diffuse way, shall we say, than some of the um, bees and hoverflies and other more conventional pollinators. Thank you, Helen. There's, a, there's another question that we're uh, relating to plants where we've been asked what kind of plants are attractive to ladybirds. So maybe give us a, a top three plants that, that you could have in your garden for ladybirds. So I think in terms of for wildlife gardening for ladybirds, the most important thing for the predatory ladybirds is they have some food to eat. So it's more important that you have some plants that have a lot of aphids on them, I would say, or the scale insects on them rather than the actual plant. But as it happens, you know, broad beans, for instance, if I go in my garden at the moment, I mean, most of my plants are covered in aphids. I have a haven for ladybirds um, because I have a haven for pest insects. Um, so that's what it's all about, really. Um, so I tend to when I'm mowing the lawn and things I leave the plants or the flowers that look like they're going to be good for the pollinating insects and I leave those already covered in aphids so I've got nettles in my um I've got nettles all the way around the edge of my garden they are fantastic for um ladybirds love nettle aphids but I've also some thistles in my lawn that I've let grow and they are covered in aphids and they're benefiting not only the ladybirds, but the parasitic wasps, there's hoverflies coming in. Um, it's just fantastic to see. So if you could have a little patch of nettles, I think that is really, really fantastic. And then for the winter time, making sure that there's some um, structures around for the ladybirds to kind of nestle under for their overwintering so leaving some leaf litter down leaving some sticks and little bundles um, of debris around can be really beneficial um, for the ladybirds well you, I, as you probably guess i'm all for that as well uh, it's great for, for lots of other things as well isn't it so um peter we've got a hand up so you're going to get a lucky dip question i don't know what you're going to get here um okay. andrew arnold are you able to unmute yourself and ask peter your question directly okay can you hear me yes we can hello andrew hello uh peter uh look i've got a question about the hemolymph which is the material that uh Lady, some ladybirds exude from, I think, from their tibia, from the uh, from the junctions. Yeah. Um, which um, can be quite uh, quite a strong odor. Absolutely. What yeah. Can you tell us about it and its function, etc. Yeah, sure. So this is basically the ladybirds can squeeze this. Effectively, it's their blood system, and they can squeeze these droplets out as a defense mechanism is the, is the reason for being, doing that. So if they're under attack, um, then they can, you know, squeeze this stuff out of their legs, as you say, and it's the hemolymph contains, um, or the reflex blood contains toxins. It smells pretty bad. Uh, and the, the range of toxins varies between species. Um, and it's quite sticky and brightly coloured and so on. And it's um, so it's a, it, basically it's a defence mechanism that they can uh, use to protect themselves. I don't know if Helen wants to add anything to that. No, I think that's a really great answer. I think that stickiness is important as well because it can really, like if a spider grabs at a ladybird, that sort of sticky excretion really gets them into a bit of a tangle. Um, but yeah, I mean, if any of you've held a ladybird and you've had that yellow 
substance and you smell it, it smells slightly different for every ladybird. And that's because every ladybird has a slightly different cocktail of chemicals within that hemolymph. And that's why we think some of them are mimicking one another. So the two spot ladybird seems to have the, the sort of nicest chemicals, um, whereas some of the others like the Chilocarini have really quite nasty chemicals. And it's maybe that some of the more tasty ladybirds are, are mimicking the less tasty ones. Great, thank you very much. Great question. question. Kieran, you're, you're muted. You are muted, Kieran. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Uh, what I was going to ask is just a very quick question. There's one in the chat asking, is there anywhere where you can find images of the larvae of inconspicuous ladybirds? Is there a, a nice resource for that? Uh, no. <laughs> Yeah, the lab is go. tricky. Um, that no. was Yvonne's question. So if she'd like to create yeah. it, that would be brilliant. It, it, that's not a very helpful answer, is it? I mean, the trouble with the inconspicuous um, larvae is we do have some images of some of the species, but it's the, the, they look very similar. I mean, to be frank, I, I, don't, I wouldn't be able to tell apart the larvae of one skimness species from another. Um, and no doubt there are people that could do that but um, they look really similar and unless you rear them through you're not going to be sure which species you've got. The, um, because people don't find these inconspicuous larvae very much generally, uh, we just don't have a good bank of images for that I'm afraid and that's the reason why they were left out of the field guide so I'm sorry about that but they, we just didn't have access to the material. So perhaps Yvonne can go around collecting everything and rearing everything and provide us with some image. I mean, you can look online and there'll be some images of some of the species, but... Um, and some people are having amazing success at rearing them through, aren't they? We've had recorders telling us that they've reared them all the way through, which is, I just find, I mean, it just is amazing. So, you know, give it a go and that's the way to find out what they are. They're such cute larvae. I mean, they would be a pleasure to have in your house, but they um, are very tricky to tell apart. Um, so, Helen, I've got a question here about symmetry in the wings from Iona. She's asked, are ladybirds like butterflies, where their wings tend to be symmetrical? So we heard a lot about the variation in patterns, but would, would the variation be symmetrical, I suppose, as well? Yeah, so they're mostly they are symmetrical. Sometimes we get really interesting pictures sent through to us where they're not, where there's a bit of difference between them. And there seems to be um, either some sort of genetic mutation that has led to that, um, or it can be sometimes a consequence of damage. So sometimes a ladybird can get frost damage and that can change the patterning um, picture on one side. But more often than not, they are amazingly symmetrical. I don't know if you, I mean, we don't often do repeat get pictures of um, asymmetrical ones, just very occasionally. Yeah, very rare. You know, I've probably got five or six pictures from 10 years worth of records. So very yeah. unusual to, to see that. Um, we've got another couple of recording questions that I think I can answer myself and do quickly. And then we can move on to something more about ecology or ID. Somebody has asked if you get, I'm, um, nature spot records and somebody's asked if you get records of ladybirds that are just put through a general form in i record am, am i right either of you in saying that any records that end up in i record which would include nature spot records go to the lady uk ladybird survey so we certainly see all of the um all of the ones that come through any form that feeds into iRecord. It can sometimes be that someone sets up their own survey and then they're managing those records behind the scene. But the important thing is that once they are in those systems and once they're in those online systems, we can share them very, very easily. So I would say to everyone, if you have a preference of a system to use, then use it, but just double check how your data is going to be used further down the line. And if you want it to be used really widely, um, and freely by everyone. Just double check that it is going to be shared in that way. So we share ours as widely as we possibly can um, to make sure, because it's not really ours, it's all of yours. So we, we, we want it to be used far and wide to answer many questions um, by many people. 
perhaps we should just clarify re uh, about iNaturalist as well, because I mean, that came up a little bit before, but whilst we don't directly, well, we do end up getting the iNaturalist records, don't we? So there isn't a need if you put a record into iNaturalist to put it into iRecord as well. No. It, it will find its way to us. We won't perhaps be able to interact with you as, as nicely, but we'll see the record in the end from iNaturalist. Yeah, okay, um, Peter, Peter, I've got an idea, a couple of ID questions here that are about harlequins. So mm -hmm. Lawrence has asked, do harlequins have small heads relative to their body size? Mm -hmm. And Nigel has asked, is it true only harlequins have orange legs? Uh, the answer to the first question is, I'm not sure, to be frank, whether the head is relatively small compared to the body size with other ladies where's helen's shaking no i no, don't I think it noticed. is no any difference um so that's probably pretty standard the second question no there are various species that have pale legs so orange or brown or reddy colored legs so for example the 10 spot ladybird has pale legs um and various of the other ones 14 spot tends to have fairly pale legs so looking at the leg colour, and really you can only separate it between sort of black and browny reddy, sort of two distinctions, very dark or not so dark. Um, there'll be lots of species in each group there, but it's just one extra thing to look for. Okay. Helen, I've got a question for you now. Um, there was a couple of questions specific to the 10 spot, but also about different colour variations in general about what causes the variations in colour and if there's a specific purpose for it. Mm. And then off the back of that as well, are they able to interbreed between the different colour morphs within a species? Yeah, really excellent question. So just in terms of the um, first question around why, it's a kind of conundrum really from a sort of evolution perspective because these colours are warning um, predators, for instance, that the ladybirds don't taste very nice. Theoretically, you would imagine that they'll all end up looking the same, so they all give out that same kind of message that they're distasteful. And yet we have that huge variation. And as we've explained, probably partly it could be to do with some of them mimicking others that are sort of um, more, those ladybirds are investing more in their toxins. Some of those who are perhaps a little bit lazier and in investing in their toxins mimic the others. Um, but also it can be at their thoughts around temperature as well. So for example, the dark color forms um, warm up more. And I see it with harlequin ladybirds that often the melanic color forms, the black ones with the red spots that up and about earlier on in the day, they've got their, they've warmed up enough to get going and the orange color form, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit later. So there could be something about the way in which they warm up um, depending on their color. And it's also been shown that the temperature that they pupate at has an effect on the spot size, for instance. So harlequin ladybirds that pupate in cold temperatures have much bigger splodgier spots than those. So those that we start seeing now that are pupating in the warmer temperatures might even be spotless or have really teeny tiny spots. So there's, there's lots of thoughts around these different color patterns. They are, um, they do have a genetic underpinning and within a species, the different color forms can um, interbreed. Um, so there's no hybridization between species. So even with the closely related ones like the 10 spot and the two spot, you might see them mating in the field, but they won't, it won't lead to offspring. But within the different color forms within a species, they can most definitely um, interbreed. Okay, we've had a lot of quite a lot of questions today, so I don't think we're going to get through them all. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question, and um, John Cole has had his hand up. Um, so, John, if you can unmute yourself, I've done that. Yeah. Um, oh, if you can let us know who you'd like to direct your question at as well, Peter or Helen. Oh, uh, the, uh, Helen, I guess, or Peter on the uh, iRecord. Um, if I submit a, a general record, I think it was not under the ladybird specific thing, presumably you can pick that up, is that correct? Yeah. So you, they'll just come through to you automatically. 
Yes, they will. And actually, I've started more often. I don't know if I should confess this, but because when if you're recording across a lot of different groups, the iRecord app is really very, very good. So I have downloaded the iRecord app and I often put my Ladybird records through the iRecord app rather than the Ladybird app. Um, so they all come into the same place. We can see which different ways they've come through. Um, but yeah, whatever's your preference, we'll get to see them. Okay, great. I think uh, yeah, just thank you. Thing, a thing on Andrew's um, question on bleeding and from the, mm. I think technically that's called reflex bleeding, isn't it? If I remember my. That's quite right. It is called reflex days. bleeding. Yeah, no, it absolutely <laughs> is. And it's a fascinating process because it's thought that somehow or other they have little kind of filters in place so that they're, they're not losing lots of cells. They're just using the kind, they're losing the sort of fluid that those cells are floating in around the body. So they're very clever at managing to. Kind of look after themselves at the same time and apparently the, the sort of volume of reflex bleeding they can do is quite dramatic no, i'm just glad i have have hadn't forgotten all mine no <laughs> no you're an absolute you're a star john you oh, wouldn't yeah, forget right. it <laughs> yeah if, if people have got more questions about i record we've actually done a couple of sessions on i record so it might be worth having a look at our playlist of previous sessions um because i do touch a little bit in there on verification and how it works on iRecord. Um, before we go up, because we've, got, we've had a lot of ID questions and we've had a lot of ecology questions, so I just wanted to clarify something with you, Helen. Obviously, we've got up on the screen here that the field guide to the ladybirds of Britain and Ireland seems to be the, the best text if you want and something that covers all of the ladybirds um, in the UK and Ireland. Uh, but is there, a, is there an, a different publication that's maybe useful if you want to find out more about ladybird behaviour and ecology? So we have included a lot of information on ladybird ecology within the ladybird field guide. And um, I mean, the, back in 1994, Mike Majurus published um, The New Naturalist. That is just, I mean, that when I started my PhD on ladybirds, I read that whole book in a day. I think it might have even been an afternoon. It's just amazing and it's still amazing. So that's a wonderful publication, but I don't know how easy it is to get hold of. But we've kind of given a, a, a lot of information because I have a bit of a passion for parasites. So um, we've got quite a lot on parasites in the field guide to the ladybirds of Britain and Ireland. Um, there's also the, um, the naturalist handbooks as well. And we've got quite a bit of ecology in there. Perfect. Thank you, Pete. And also that's got field keys. So if you'd rather use a more sort of keying out approach to identification, then you might like to look at um, that one. The thing about the field guide is it's our most recent publication and um, it does include all the sort of latest distribution maps and um, the sort of all of the, the species. So there's some extra species in there that weren't in our um, naturalist handbook. But um, when we published this book, somebody did say to me, do we really need another book on ladybirds? And actually now you're saying that maybe we need an even another book on ladybirds. I don't think we can ever have enough books on ladybirds. Um, but hopefully what we've got out there at the moment um, alongside the website and those fantastic field charts, even those have got some ecology on the back as well. So um, yeah, we're always happy to give out even more information, but um, probably I would go with the field guide to the ladybirds of Britain and Ireland. Okay, brilliant. Um, right, okay. I think what we'll do now then is, because we've run over a little bit, might have to 